In this video, I'm going to go through um, the anterior approach to the ankle as we get set for our upcoming webinar uh, discussing um, pilon fractures. Uh, this approach has been popularized predominantly by the um, interest in ankle arthroplasty, but also the uh, using it for ankle fusions. And I think having maybe a renewed interest uh, for those who are treating pilon fractures as well, especially when you consider some of the access you can get with this approach, and then also the um, uh, thought process around secondary surgeries, if you think somebody may be going on to needing an ankle fusion or an arthroplasty, given the high risk of developing arthritic changes to the joint. So I wanted to go through it just so you can get some understanding of what we're, structures we're looking at as you are watching on the back table um, and have an understanding of what, what we're looking at. So this, um, this is a case here in which you can see an, a pilon fracture in a, in a young gentleman. And I like to use this view when it comes to pilons to be able to sort out what the um, approach is going to give me. You know, there's a lot of different approaches to an ankle. There's the anterior medial, there's the direct anterior, there's the anterior lateral, posterior lateral, and the posterior medial. But I'm going to focus on the anterior um, approach on, on this video um, because each of these would take some time to go through. So your incision is, you know, right in the middle of the ankle joint and it, um, you know, at this at this level, at the superficial level, you're pretty safe from anything dangerous. You do have the superficial perineal nerve. I cheat this just a little bit more medial, and I'll go between the anterior tibialis and the extensor hallucis longest. Now, this is in Hoppenfeld's text, and in this text, he goes between the EHL and the EDL, which is a reasonable approach, but I'll tend to go a little bit more medial. I'll pull anterior tibialis medial, I'll pull extensor hallucis longus lateral, um, and, and I'll um, tell you why here in a second. The uh, incision, I don't want to undermine a ton here. I want to try to preserve the depth and, and because the skin healing is not always that great in this area, and I'll discuss that why in a few seconds. So this is what you look like, what you're looking at. You have the SPN at the distal aspect of the incision kind of trailing into the wound. So you do want to be able to careful, be careful to protect it and dissect it free so you don't cut it, particularly if you're coming in and out with saws like in an arthroplasty. The um, cut can be made in a couple different ways. One option is to actually step cut the fascial cut. And that way you make sure you have good overlying tissue because you really want to do a good job of getting a nice retinacular repair at the completion of the case, so as to avoid bow stringing from the anterior tib or the extensor hallucis longus, which creates this, um, this tension effect, this pressure effect on that anterior wound. So if you, sometimes you can cut it if you're a little bit concerned about the integrity, by all means, you need to make sure that you take care to close that in a very detailed fashion at the completion of the case. And then this is kind of what you're looking at. Again, this is out of Hoppenfield's text. In this text, they call the uh, picture here. Um, uh, let me let me uh, show you here. This as the EHL and this as the um, EDL. Um, and I'll actually come on the other side of EHL. So I'm going just a little more medial so I get a little bit more protection from superficial perineal nerve. And then... Proximally, what I'll do is I'll go in with the tenotomy scissors in the proximal aspect of the wound. I'll dissect and find the neurovascular bundle there, and then I'll retract that laterally. And so once I find it proximally, then I feel more confident going kind of straight to bone. So I don't undermine a ton of the tissue and I can create deep flaps all the way down to bone and avoid undermining to try to minimize the chance of having wound complications. So then I will um, work my way uh, distal and I'll create these flaps usually with a scalpel. You can do it also with a bovi and I'll use army navy retractors, one medially and one laterally. And that gives me pretty good exposure, particularly if I'm doing like an anterior um, approach for an ankle arthroplasty. So my neurovascular bundle for me is going laterally. Um, in this image, they show it coming medially, but that's if you're between EDL and EHL. 
uh, I go between anterior tib and EHL because um, I find it protects the superficial nerve a little bit better. I can, um, the neurovascular bundle uh, tends to want to just sit under EHL and I find that nice and retract protected with that uh, approach um, and seems to do pretty well. Another modification is to take it a little bit more medial and you can pull the anterior tibialis. Um, uh, medial, this would be more in the realm of like an anterior medial approach if you needed to. Again, you got to be careful about repairing that retinaculum so that you don't bowstring um, after the reconstruction. One of the downsides of the anterior approach is what we refer to as the angiosomes. And what the angiosomes are, are basically patches in the skin that are supplied by a particular vessel. So in the anterior aspect of the ankle, you have the anterior tibial artery, which supplies that anterior part of the wound. And what happens with the anterior approach is, that, as you can imagine, is you're splitting this right in the middle. And the general thought is that if you can go on the edges of the angiosome, then you have best of both worlds where you have blood supply from both like the laterals, the perineal um, angiosome, as in this case, and the anterior tib. If you go um, along, along this border here, if you go intermedial, then you can kind of preserve that angiosome. And there is a modified intermedial approach, which has been... Um, is I found it personally helpful in cases in which have a previous intermedial incision. So I'll make this kind of lazy S and that actually preserves some of the blood supply from the angiosome and actually seems to do pretty well. The other advantage of that is you kind of tack all that retinaculum down and it lays right down on top of that anterior tibial tendon. It really ties, it really seems to minimize um, the bow stringing. So one of those modifications that you can use um, if in a pinch. So that's the anterior approach. Remember that. You want to make sure you look for the superficial perineal nerve. You want to get a good layer and closure of the retinaculum. You want to look for the neurovascular bundle and decide if you're going to take it, go between anterior tib and EHL and retract it laterally or between EDL and EHL and retract it medially. But either way, just find it proximally. And once you find it, you can, you, can, you can be a little more aggressive with the dissection because you know it's going to be protected. What I would say is if you're in this situation of trauma, that sometimes that neurovascular bundle can be in uh, a different spot. And so you do want to be a little bit more careful with that, that it can be entrapped in the fracture fragments. It can be, um, it can be displaced from one side to the next. So you do kind of have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about that in, in, the, in the approach. And then remember on the repair, you wanna make sure to get a good retinacular closure, um, a good skin closure, because the wound healing issues of these in relation to the angiosome can be a little bit uh, tricky. Hope that helps.